you very much. I'd like you parents in the audience to imagine for a moment <clears throat> you have a sick child and you have to bring them to the hospital. And after some pretty bad poking and prodding and, and tests, the physicians come back to you and tell you that one of your child's organs is failing. And then they tell you, you may have to wait years to get a replacement organ and that this is a life-threatening situation that your child may not survive. Now, this devastating situation happens every day to many, many people. In fact, in the United States alone, 130,000 people are waiting for an organ transplant, but only one out of four is going to get one this year. So now I want you to think about a future scenario. And this time, after all the tests, the doctors come back and they're smiling and they say, not to worry, go, away, go back home for a couple of months, and then when you come back, we will have grown a brand new organ that's specific to your child from their own stem cells. <clears throat> now, scientists can't, can't grow whole organs yet, but they have been able to turn stem cells into small clusters of cells that make insulin, and they're testing these in people with diabetes. And they've made simple sheets of cells from stem cells that are being tested in, in certain forms of blindness. However, to make whole three-dimensional organs is going to take a vast collaboration across big areas of science and medicine. Now, I'm the chief scientific officer at the Center for Stem Cell and Organoid Medicine, and that's exactly what a very talented and collaborative group of scientists, physicians, bioengineers, and industry partners work on every day. Our goal is to make organs for transplantation. <clears throat> and while we can't do that yet, some breakthrough discoveries over the past few years, I think, have us well on our way. In 2009, my lab discovered how to turn stem cells, which grow as simple flat sheets of cells, into three-dimensional organ-like structures that are called organoids. Now, organoids have many similar properties to real organs, except they're much smaller, about the size of a pea. But you can make organoids from any person in this audience or any patient in the clinic, starting from your own stem cells. This really, I think, is one of the first organoid centers of its kind. <clears throat> now, how did we figure out how to do this? Well, we learned from nature, and what we learned is that we all come from a single cell that divides and forms smaller parts that get assembled into larger parts that make up the organs of the body. And my lab has spent two decades trying to figure out how organs form using animals. And <clears throat> what we learned from this is that we all form in a stepwise process, starting from smaller parts. And what we do is now use this information from the laboratory as a blueprint or a roadmap to bioengineer tissues in a Petri dish. And we start with pluripotent stem cells, which are very special kinds of stem cells because they can become any cell or tissue type in your body, and they can be made from any one of you in the laboratory. And what we learn from stem cells is that organs are assembled from smaller parts. And we replicate this process in the Petri dish, first by bombarding stem cells with biochemicals and coaxing them into forming these smaller parts which we then help guide into larger and more functional organoids. Now, of course, you all know that organs are highly complex, and all the little parts have to be assembled in exactly the right way for the organ to form properly. Take the intestine, for example. The intestine is made up of dozens of different cell types, and it's assembled in many different layers. The inner layer absorbs the nutrients in the food that we eat, but that layer is surrounded by layers of muscle, layers of nerves, even layers of blood vessels, and they have to come together exactly in the right way, not just to absorb the food that we eat, but to push the food we eat from one direction all the way down through the other direction. And of course, we all know what happens when that process goes in reverse. It never ends well. Now, the organoids that we can make in the lab actually have many of these layers of complexity. They have an inner layer that can absorb nutrients, they're surrounded by layers of muscle. We've even engineered them to have layers of nerves. These things even contract in a Petri dish. These really are highly complex bioengineered tissues. Now, my lab can now make organoids from any of the digestive, disease, uh, any of the digestive organs in your body. We can make stomach organoids that secrete acid, intestinal organoids that absorb nutrients, and our organoid center is expanding into other organs, like the kidney, the heart, even the brain. 
Now, none of these organoids are ready for transplantation therapies yet, but they are incredibly useful in, in, for, as patient avatars. Now, what do I mean by that? We're all different. Uh, we even get diseases differently. Even a common cold might affect me in the chest and somebody else in the head. And how we respond to drugs is very differently, uh, is very different between one person to the next. Take cancer, for example. A drug might cure cancer in one patient, but cause great harm in another patient. So my lab is growing organoids from cancer patients and giving them to, to cancer biologists who are now using them to test whether a drug might actually work on that type of cancer or for that patient. In the Netherlands, they're using organoids from patients to test experimental drugs for diseases like cystic fibrosis, where they actually test the drug on the patient organoid first in the lab, and then, if it works, they use it on the patient with a much higher degree of success. But I think, to me, one of the coolest ways we're using organoids is to diagnose patients with really complicated diseases, particularly when the normal barrage of tests fail to uncover the cause. We had a patient come into the medical center with a highly complicated disease affecting the pancreas, the stomach, and the intestine. And while the physicians did a great job figuring out what was wrong with the pancreas, none of these really invasive tests were able to figure out what was wrong with the stomach and the intestine. So a scientist in my lab actually made organoids from that patient and in the laboratory figured out what was wrong with the patient. And now we're working with a team of physicians to come up with a brand new treatment strategy that is specifically designed for that patient. <clears throat> Now, of course, what we want and what, what we all want are to be able to take these and use them for transplantation-based therapies in the future. And, of course, that is in the future. But what are we doing today to make that future a reality? Well, basically, we're trying to make our organoids bigger, more functional, more like real organs. So to make them bigger, we're trying a bunch of different things. One thing we're trying is we're working with engineers. To, grow, to, to make chambers in which we can grow our organoids bigger. If you remember at the beginning of my talk, I told you our organoids were only the size of a pea. Now we can grow organoids as big as your thumb. We're also trying to make them more functional tissues. So we're engineering in complexity like nerves, muscles, blood vessels, even immune cells. And lastly, we're working hand in glove in close collaboration with surgeons to test whether our bioengineered bio organ tissues can actually cure disease, first in an animal model, but of course with the ultimate goal that nobody should be told that they may die waiting for an organ for transplantation. So I get asked all the time, why on earth did you become a scientific researcher? And for me, it was pretty hardwired. You know, it was pretty easy. I ask a lot of questions. And I, I'm really compelled to figure out what the answer to those questions are. Um, and any parents in the audience, you know, your kids ask a lot of questions. They have that intrinsic curiosity. So I'm not talking to the parents anymore. I'm talking to the young folks in the audience. You keep asking those questions. Or better still, when you leave today, Go out there and try to find out some of the answers to those questions. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.